Hello, welcome to Teaching Computer Science in Elementary. My name is David Hay. I work for Elk Island Public Schools. I am a grade five teacher in Sherwood Park. My email address and Twitter username are there if you want to get in touch at any point. And the URL for this slide deck is also on the screen, tinyurl.com slash teaching CS Elementary with a capital T, C, S, and E. And this is all Creative Commons, so you can do with it whatever you'd like. Quick introduction to me. I taught uh, high school physics and some computer science and technology courses for about 10 years. Then I was a, an innovation consultant at Central Office in Elk Island Public Schools for seven years. I've been teaching elementary for a few years, and also I took a year to work on the Callisto project, which we'll hear about a little later. This session is about teaching computer science in elementary, and uh, we may be teaching computer science probably at some point in the next little while. We'll look at free resources, ways to implement computer science, both in the current curriculum and we'll also look at the draft program of studies and uh, maybe talk about establishing communities of practice and how we can share through Twitter or being in touch other ways. And you can get in touch with me if you are interested in sharing related to that. So first of all, what is computer science? So Wikipedia definition, we have the study of computation, automation, and information. And there's a link to the Wikipedia article there with a lot more information. And really, we're, we're talking about software and hardware of computing. Not necessarily coding or programming, but that's usually part of it. And particularly in elementary, that will be part of it uh, <clears throat> in the, uh, the Div 2 parts uh, of the draft program of studies that we'll look at. Computer science is also about managing data and designing and evaluating algorithms. And algorithms are a series of steps for doing things, just like we talk about standard algorithms for multiplication in math. An algorithm is just a, a series of steps. And it's also about solving problems with computation or designing problems that can be solved by computation, by the computers that we all have around us. Uh, how can we make them do our things for us? And you'll also probably hear about, I like how the BBC defines it. There's similar things from other organizations, but looking at decomposition, pattern recognition, and abstraction as kind of the fundamental parts, and then algorithms, as was mentioned. But decomposition is breaking a, a, a thing down into the independent steps or parts of it, recognizing any patterns that exist. Or, okay, this has to be done three or four times. And then abstraction is how do we apply this to a broader uh, set of problems or to uh, a broader swath of this particular problem. Uh, and that's and then designing algorithms that can do that. And some of the why, we have the Alberta Education uh, competencies uh, that we're familiar with. And a lot of those are things that we would be learning or, or teaching with computer science. And problem solving is a big one, of course. Persistence is very important, uh, something that we, we definitely need to be introducing our students to and fostering in our students is persistence at tasks. Uh, logic and critical thinking are all fundamental parts of computer science. Managing information, as was mentioned, communication and collaboration as we are doing this computer science stuff, whether it's coding or just talking about things related to it. Creativity and innovation uh, with I mean, we, we hear all sorts of things about innovative things that are happening with computers these days with virtual reality and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of these innovative things that are changing how the world works. And, and we need to be preparing students for this future or for this, for this present that we exist in, uh, in giving them these, introducing them to these things. 
It's also something that students are interested in. Uh, there's always, we have a coding club at our school, and there's always a lot of interest in learning more about these kind of uh, topics and how to do these things. Also, we, we as teachers don't need to know everything. That's the great thing about this. We don't need to be professional programmers to teach some computer science. We just need to be able to motivate students to, uh, to persist and to curate some resources to put in front of them to, uh, to introduce them to these things and, uh, and get them started on this journey. This has applications in many subjects and disciplines. There are lots of applications, obviously, in science and in math, but we can take a look at some that would be applicable to all sorts of other disciplines. It's empowering and fun. There's nothing like the uh, two hands in the air for victory of uh, solving a difficult, you know, designing an algorithm that, that solves a problem or something like that is, is very cool. And of course, uh, this is required learning. Computer science is built into curricular outcomes and, and programs of study in other places and will likely be something that we have here in Alberta as well. So speaking of the Alberta Draft Program of Studies, we have uh, this document that, that says when this is implemented, uh, it will be, there will be computer science in K through six and presumably seven through 12. We'll see some of this as well. But computer science, uh, they're saying is problem solving scientific inquiry developed through the knowledgeable application of creativity, design and computational thinking. So some of those uh, things that we mentioned already in terms of the competencies and the uh, ideas that we want students to be uh, introduced to. So the, the kindergarten draft program of studies learning outcome related to this is basically interpreting instructions in the learning environment. And we see as we get to higher and higher levels that the Instructions perhaps get a little more complicated and how they're, how they're designing instructions and looking at instructions, uh, what's happening with that. And then when we get to sort of grade four, mostly five and six, where that's where we're actually making these computational artifacts. So actually doing coding to solve these computational problems so, or solve these problems computationally. So some of the concepts that show up through this, we have instructions and sequences and, and the word algorithms is actually used. Creativity and collaboration, reliability and efficiency. These are all words that, that show up in the draft program of studies. Debugging or I think troubleshooting is used sometimes as well. Repetition, uh, decomposition. Uh, I don't know if that word is specifically used, but uh, breaking down, finding patterns and similarities looking at the design and planning and creating and organizing and all of those things we do in any sort of project uh, that we would also do with uh, computer science. And then building, testing, enhancing, refining, repeating, looking through that whole iterative process. Code and visual block-based languages show up in Div 2. Abstraction is a word that, uh, that comes up there, uh, looking at the impacts of this and uh, looking at Conditional statements, if then kind of things, looking at variables and operators, uh, you know, multiplying, dividing, those sorts of things. These are concepts that show up in the, uh, the draft program of studies document. And there's a link to that draft studies uh, program of studies. But coding, I, and specifically looking at visual block-based languages, and we'll look at some examples of that, uh, is really only in grades five and six that they're needing to do that. In grade four, they have implemented a design plan by creating physical or computational artifacts. So that could be what our education minister has talked about of, you know, writing steps out on a piece of paper and, and giving that to one of your, one of the classmates and the classmate does those series of steps. And grade three, similar sort of things as a set of instructions to be followed by a human or machine. There's an opinion overview kind of document uh, article about this and uh, a more in-depth analysis of digital literacies in the curriculum and some links there that you can take a look at. And let's take a look at some of the possible platforms and resources that we could use for teaching computer science in elementary. 
Let's take a look at Scratch. There's also Scratch Junior, which is similar for younger children, which is an app for iOS and Android. But let's take a look at Scratch specifically. So we can create something without logging in. Of course, students can and staff can log in uh, and save their projects that way. But uh, Scratch, we have this drag and drop block based coding, visual coding environment where we can move this cat around or there are many other sprites that we can use and we can tell stories with this. We can do all sorts of interesting things and you're probably, you've probably heard of Scratch somewhat. Uh, we can do interesting things with it, but just as a quick example, let's say we wanted to move the cat a certain number of steps and then turn a certain amount and uh, do that when or do that let's say four times so if we have the cat move 100 uh, let's do 50 steps and then turn 90 degrees and then if we double click that Oh, we get, or just click that, we get the the cat uh, making a square. Now, we might want to slow that down. We can do other ways of moving around. We can glide to particular positions or other things like that. We can also have the cat say things or think things, and that's a great way to start telling stories. Or as I said, it doesn't have to be a cat specifically. We don't even have to have that in there. We can even just do mathematical algorithms. We can have the variables here. We can define some variables and add some things. I'll link to a another YouTube video of finding factors using Scratch. So I'll, I'll add that to the slide deck. But uh, this is uh, the Scratch drag and drop programming environment. Blockly is another drag and drop programming environment, visual coding language that uh, there are a lot of things that are built on Blockly. And so this Blockly demos has, for example, just uh, some things where we can do some math and uh, find some values, create some lists and variables and things like that. So this is just a, a basic demo to, to run some code and do some interesting things with it. The cool thing about Blockly though is we can actually do drag and drop coding to uh, find, uh, to if, uh, we won't do it that way, but once we, we drag some things in, we can let's say here let's just do something as simple as this print abc we can see what that looks like in javascript in python php other languages and and such uh, and maybe we can even as we make changes to the, the the blockly we see that that changes these other languages as well so this might be a good transition to introducing uh, Syn syntax-based coding in Python or JavaScript or something else like that. I've also created some coding challenges uh, such as finding the perfect squares, so just enough code blocks here that you can use it to figure out uh, what, how to find the perfect squares up to 100 and it automatically generates the Python code down in the bottom here. And when you run the, run the code, uh, it uh, will, here, let's say print something like that. So run the code, it shows it down here, and then we can clear the output and try again, that sort of thing. So, and there are challenge solutions, possible solutions for each of those, just as an image if you want to refer to that. So that is linked to in the slideshow and feel free to use that. Microsoft Make Code is another drag and drop 
block-based visual programming environment and so you can have students following through these tutorials and such to create games and uh, such so let's just try a basic project though and same sort of thing we can drop in different blocks that do different things uh, and that in this case make code arcade is programming this little virtual uh, game boy kind of thing and uh, we can set the background to whatever we want to do like that and then when we start we see that will appear in our virtual game boy that we can play uh, then play the game we can also program BBC Microbits with this. And uh, BBC Microbit, as you see here, is this little programmable microcontroller, plugs in by USB or connects by Bluetooth. And we can, again, create projects or uh, we can go through previously created tutorials. And again, over on the left, we've got a simulator of the, of the Microbit and we can drop some blocks in. And as soon as we add in these music blocks, it should show us that, oh, if you're using a physical micro bit, hook it up to your headphones this way, and you can listen to it through the physical thing uh, as well. If you have a uh, version two, I believe it has a built-in speaker, but all of these kind of things you can create with the drag and drop code and then run it on your micro bit uh, to the connected device. Speaking of devices, we can also use make code to program our, if you've got uh, Lego Mindstorms EV3 kits, you can program them with this same sort of environment and uh, see what happens. So we've got all the sensors and motors that you're familiar with if you're familiar with that EV3 environment. And then there's also this built into Minecraft Education Edition. This is Minecraft Education Edition. Let's create a new world and we'll make it just, we'll make it creative and let's make it just a flat world. And we'll just start there. So Minecraft Education Edition requires some licensing. You can talk to your IT people about that. It's uh, set up for a lot of the schools divisions in Alberta, but again, you have to talk to your IT department about whether it's set up for you or not. Uh, students and staff will need Microsoft accounts to be able to sign into it, but I have another presentation here on that that I'll link to uh, in the slide deck. All right, so this is Minecraft Education Edition and we have this flat world here. And what we're looking at today is doing some coding. So if we press the C key, it gives us three different ways we can build code. We can use make code like we were just looking at. We can use some Python coding in sort of a notebook interface. Uh, that's a little more difficult. And then Tinker is another one we'll take a look at a little later, uh, probably. But uh, Tinker is, uh, I think, not quite as friendly for students to get started. So we'll, we'll try Microsoft Make Code here. And once again, there are a bunch of tutorials and uh, things for students to walk through. But let's just uh, try a project here. And we get the same drag and drop interface and we have all sorts of things that we can do that are specific to Minecraft. So if we want this on chat command jump, we can teleport to 100 blocks above where we started and then we click play. T to open the chat and we type the jump and then it teleported us way up into the sky and then we fall down there. Now, you notice that this little guy here spawned. Uh, that is an agent. So the agent can place blocks and interact with things just like a player. So let's have the agent 
do some placing blocks kind of things. So let's have agent plant some trees by filling its first slot with trees, place black back, and then move forward. There we go. Now let's put that all inside a loop to do it a bunch of times. And let's 10 times, maybe have the agent move forward too so that there's a little space in between the trees. And that's on start, so we click the start button and then we watch our agent planting trees. Just like that. So that's a quick introduction to Minecraft coding. Here is Tinker. We can have a classroom set up or we can just create a project. There are again tutorials and all sorts of things in here. We're looking mostly at block coding, but you can also do some other types of coding in Tinker. And uh, it gives you some code to start with. The blocks look a little different from previous types of ones, but again, the same kind of thing works that we have the loops uh, are blocks that go around other code that do various things. And just like in Scratch, we have this character that we can animate and uh, we can click start to animate that character doing these things. So walking, animate the walking, move 10 pixels, if one edge bounce uh, and wait and does those sorts of things. So we have all of the operators and variables and things like that that we'd expect in a block based coding environment. So that is Tinker. There are also apps, lots of apps for teaching computational thinking and computer science and programming like Swift Playgrounds or uh, Daisy the Dinosaur or Hopscotch and all of these other sorts of ones. Uh, there's Scratch Junior again that we mentioned. There is the Callisto project, which we'll talk a little more about later, but it is curriculum aligned things that uh, involve programming. Definitely check out the turtle programming on there. It's very cool. Twilio Quest is a great game that is designed to teach Python or JavaScript. It does need to be installed, so it needs to run on a PC, Mac, or Linux computer. Code Combat is another one that is kind of gamified teaching of languages like Python and JavaScript. Uh, C++ Code Academy is another one. So Twilio Quest looks like that. There's Code Combat, uh, Code Academy for uh, learning coding uh, as well. You can program physical things. We mentioned the microbit and the Mindstorm ZV3. There's also the Mbot robot, which is kind of based on the Arduino platform. There's also an Mbot2 uh, that's out that is great. Uh, the Arduino uh, environment, so an Arduino board is like that or like that or many other ones. Uh, and then Microbit, of course, is another kind of the newest of the microcontrollers for learning coding. And you can do all of those. You can simulate Arduinos and Tinker uh, and Microbits and such on the Tinkercad circuits. So you can actually build these circuits, which is great for grade five science uh, and also just for playing with circuits. And then because I added in, so you can drop in all of these things. Uh, and uh, because I added in a micro bit, there's also a, a code part here. So you can actually code the micro bit that's there. And if we, let's zoom in a bit and start the simulation. And so this code is telling it to write the, <clears throat> the pins high and low. So high is on and low is off to light up these LEDs that are there and you can do all sorts of different coding in that. And then there are organizations like code.org and Canada Learning Code where they have lots of educational resources for teaching coding and helping out with 
uh, whatever sorts of things. They have asynchronous and synchronous resources that you can check out there. Now, there may be a lot of excitement and uh, perhaps anxiety about uh, these sorts of things that we may need to be teaching fairly soon. There's a lot of potential to it, a lot of fun to be had, but it is new learning for a lot of people, new th things to try out. This is not just, you know, a new category like rocks and minerals or uh, chemistry or something like that. It, it is uh, new and there might be some anxiety uh, related to that. We also don't know if this will be implemented. Uh, we don't know if it'll be implemented at the same time as a whole bunch of different things. There was an announcement recently as I'm recording this that the new science in K-6 would not be implemented in the fall, but uh, we're just going to be starting with some of it. But even when science is implemented, there will be a lot of new th things uh, coming in at the same time. We don't know yet. Hopefully there will be opportunities for professional learning. Of course, we have sessions like this and there will be hopefully also some things uh, with your school divisions or at your schools. We don't know what resources will be provided yet. If there will be, there probably won't be textbooks, but will be there. Will there be some sort of digital version of textbooks? Uh, we can start to collect some things and uh, start to use some things in what we're teaching now, but what will this look like in the future when either this is, these are things that we're wanting to implement in what we currently have or when we have new programs of study. And so hopefully we can start to establish some, some communities to practice or even just collaborating with colleagues. There are many of us around, uh, around Alberta and around the world that are teaching a lot of the same things. And so connecting on social media or just emailing people or maybe some resource sharing sites, some nonprofit organizations, I mentioned a few, or other convention sessions are ways that we can be learning about some of these kind of things. So that's sort of the, uh, the nutshell of uh, the ideas around teaching computer science in elementary education. And uh, I'll have some examples after this, but uh, if you want to get in touch, you can email me or connect on uh, Twitter or other social media. Again, there's uh, a link to this. Thanks for watching, and as I said, if you want to stay for some more examples, you can do so, or you can click these links in the slide deck, and those are shorter videos, or uh, in some cases, uh, this one is a set of written out activities for these kind of things. Here's a set of Blockly blocks that we're going to use to create the game Beep Buzz. Now Beep Buzz is a game normally played around the classroom or around a circle or something like that where everybody says a number but in if the number is divisible by three you say beep and if it's divisible by five you say buzz and then if it's divisible by both three and five then we then you say beep buzz. So we're going to use these code blocks and we're going to say n is the number. We're going to start off with setting n to one, and then we're going to loop that uh, up to 30 here. So we need a comparison in, in there. Uh, so while n is less than or equal to, We'll change that number to 30. So we're going to say the number if there's a bunch of conditions that are not met. So we're going to need to put in this if block and we'll need a bunch of else ifs as well in here. Uh, we'll, we'll just start off like that. So the else will be that will say the number. So if none of the, the previous conditions are met, we're going to, uh, to say just the number. Now, if the number, uh, so we're going to say the remainder of, oh, we need an equals here. So if the remainder of 
n divided by 3 is equal to 0. So that is no remainder after dividing by 3. Then we're going to say uh, divided by 3. Then, we go, then we're going to say beep. And then we also need that for buzz. And we're, let's, we need another else if in here because we're going, we need a beep buzz as well. So there, there's a beep. Let's duplicate that and say divided by five. Then we're going to print buzz. And then we need both of those together. So we need to use this and. So let's duplicate that. So if it's that and this, then we're going to say beep buzz. So all of that code, uh, if we run it, Oh, it's not quite going to work because we need to change n by 1 after each of the iterations. Otherwise, it's just going to go through and just keep saying 1. So let's run that code. And if we scroll down, we say we see 1, 2, beep, 4, buzz, beep, 7, 8, all the way up to 30, which is again beep, buzz. The cool thing about this is it also shows us what the code would look like in Python. Uh, if we had a Python interpreter, it would uh, we could run it from that. So there is some Blockly code for the game Beep Buzz. Let's try creating a Fibonacci sequence in Minecraft. A Fibonacci sequence is uh, where each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. So let's create a new project and we'll call it Fibonacci and for this we'll need a couple of variables we'll make a variable called number and we'll make a variable called previous number and we'll start out by setting the previous number to zero and setting the whoops no I don't want that. let's duplicate that and we'll set set the number to one, and that's how we'll get started. And then to display the numbers, we'll have the character say the number. Now, that's not actually going to go through the sequence, but let's put this inside a loop. Maybe we'll repeat it 10 times, so we get 10 Fibonacci numbers. So we're going to say the number, but then we need to do a little bit of math of adding the two of those together. So if we grab this math block and the two variables, so number plus previous number, and we'll need to create a new variable for that, and we'll call that variable sum. So we will set the sum to be that number plus the previous number. And then we have to change those other variables. We have to set the previous number to be equal to what the number was. And then set the new number to that sum. So what we're doing is we're saying what the number is. So it's going to say 1 and then it's going to set this variable sum to be one plus zero, and then it's going to set the previous number to be one, which, which is what it was, and then set the new number to be this sum of the two of them, uh, and then it's going to repeat that through again. So if we click play, we should see the character say those Things. So there's a good Fibonacci sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. So 13 is 8 plus 5, 21 is 13 plus 8, and so on. So there's a Fibonacci sequence from this code. But of course, the cool thing about Minecraft is we can build some blocks 
as well once we have these numbers. So let's do a little bit of filling in here and we will go from, yeah, so that's from where the player is standing, this is what those little tilde symbols mean. We'll also need another variable to say the position and we will set that position to be one in front of the person who is the, the character here and then each time we will change the position by one. And we need to put position, let's put it in the X there. And then we want the sum to be the height. So, and maybe, well, that'll go from zero. We need to start off, four is the ground. Actually, let's, let's say five, and then let's do a little math here as well of sum plus five is where we're going to build it up to. So let's see what that ends up looking like. So we see it said those Fibonacci numbers. Oh, and it was from where I was standing, so it came above my head. But anyway, that worked out. We have the Fibonacci sequence of heights there. And of course, it quickly gets very tall. So we don't actually need to do this. We can say zero is where I'm standing, and we can just say sum like that. And then if we play this again, we get the Fibonacci sequence from where I was. And because I, where I was standing, it couldn't put blocks. Uh, but it, again, made that sort of a cool uh, pattern. And we could fill with something else. But uh, that's the basics of how we can do a Fibonacci sequence of building in Minecraft. Let's try using Tinker to convert Celsius temperatures to Fahrenheit temperatures. So we won't need all of this stuff here. We know that to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, we need to multiply and add. So we're going to take our initial value uh, for Celsius and we're going to multiply it by 1.8. So whatever the Celsius value is times 1.8, and then we're going to add 32 to that. So we'll put this inside there, and then we will have uh, the character say that. Oops, that whole thing. And we need a way of uh, getting the value. So rather than just typing in a value for Celsius here, let's uh, ask, uh, no, actually, let's just use a variable. Here, we'll create a variable called C, and then put that in there, and then we will set that variable C to, let's say, 20 degrees. So the degrees Celsius is 20, and we will have our character say that value, or that th that is 68. Now, we can also join together some text here. So let's put that and we'll say degrees Fahrenheit and put that in. And then when we push play, oh, we probably want a space in front of that. Like that. So 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And we could try joining in some more things uh, and using the ask and such. But there is a basic program that students could write for doing that conversion. Using something that was developed for the Callisto project, we are going to use some Python code to generate story plots. 
uh, for writing prompts. So this is in the Curriculum Notebooks repository from Callisto.ca, and I'll link to it in the slideshow as well. But if you click Open in Callisto, it will bring you to this, where you sign in with your Google or Microsoft account, and it will, uh, once you've signed in, it will synchronize the repository. I've already synchronized the repository, so like it creates a copy of it from the curriculum notebooks online place there, and I'll open it up on here since I already had it set up. So now this is running on the Callisto hub, and we have some text that we can edit up here, but most importantly, this is the Python code, and it looks really complicated, but basically it's just some variables that are genre, protagonist, adjective, location, and activity, and then it's choosing, so those are lists of things, and we can add to the lists. Uh, we see it's a list with these square parentheses around it. We can add other things to that list, but we're using the random uh, library from Py Python library, and we're saying a genre story about a adjective protagonist, at location, doing an activity, and then we put a period at the end. So if we were, we've clicked in that, we can click run, and it tells us an action story about a friendly doctor on the moon rescuing lost puppies. And we can run that again, and we see that happens again. And we can, we can even uh, edit the code for x in range, let's do this five times. It will then print out five different story prompt prompts like that that you can then write about and uh, there are many other modules like this available on the Callisto website uh, a lot of them are math and science related but there are some English language arts and language learning and social studies actually quite a few social studies ones to check out there as well on callisto.ca so hopefully that gives you some ideas and some things to get excited about for teaching computer science in elementary. Once again, thank you for staying to the end and I hope you have a great rest of the convention.